On behalf of the family and myself, I'd like to welcome you uh, today to North Jackson Baptist Church as we celebrate the life of Carol Kimsey. Carol was born on March 20th, 1935 in Winston-Salem, North Carolina to the late Vaughn and Vera Smith Kimsey. He served his country in the U.S. Navy during which time he participated in Operation Wigwam in which his ship was involved in an underwater test of the atomic bomb. He retired from Pitney Bowes. He was preceded in death by parents Vaughn and Vera Kimsey. Mr. Kimsey is survived by wife Janice Kimsey from Jackson, Tennessee, son Gary Kimsey of Malvern, Iowa, daughter Carla Fry of Jackson, Tennessee, four grandchildren, Casey Crownover, Hatton, Alabama, Derek Fry, Huron, Tennessee, Catherine Kimsey, Jackson, Tennessee, Philip Kinsey, Oakland, Iowa, and 14 great-grandchildren. He is also survived by sisters Avides Dixon from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and Jean Carroll from Angier, North Carolina, and Minetta Beeson, Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these moments as we get to come together and and Lord, we get to look at the life of Carol Kinsey and Lord, we get to celebrate that life. Lord, for I know that Carol's passing on from this life to the next does leave a little bit of a void and it does come with some sadness for us that are left here on earth. But Lord, we can celebrate today and we can have joy in our heart, Lord, from not only the legacy that he left here on earth, but Lord, to know that he is there with you, Father, that makes it all worth it and makes it easy for us to gather here today. Lord, we ask that you be with the family and the friends and the ones that, that love him and know him over the next days and comfort them in the only way that you can. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. If we were to examine the scriptures and as I was preparing to, to come up with some scripture for the use today that would really honor Carol and, and what Carol means to me because the truth of the matter is there is a lot of people out here, his family, there are loved ones that, that could probably speak better than I can about Carol. Really all I can do is I can draw from what I know about Carol and the times that I had with him and what I saw him live out loud as his pastor here at North Jackson Baptist Church. And it brought me to one scripture found in Philippians 2.4 that says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. You know, we live, when we, when we look at this scripture and we see Paul talking to the church of Philippi, we see him telling those people, hey, don't only look out for yourself. The things that you have going on, your welfare, your well-being. But take the time to also check on other people and check on their needs and what they have going on as far as their welfare and their concerns. And at its core, if we look at that back then, man, that's so relevant for today. And as we look at it back then, I would even dare say that even today, this basic fundamental, this basic simple principle that is in Christianity is something that many Christians get wrong today. Human nature is for us to look to ourselves. It's human nature to make sure that we are taken care of, to make sure that my welfare personally is taken care of, that personally the things that I'm trying to do and the things that I'm trying to pursue, that I'm doing those things on a daily basis. It's so easy for us to get wrapped up in that. And today, especially in America, I believe that that's where Christians kind of lack is pursuing the welfare and the needs and the interests of others. But I'm here to tell you today that Carol Kimsey was one that did not only look at his own interest. He was one that looked towards the interest of others. Carol Kimsey was a longtime member of North Jackson Baptist Church and was a deacon for almost 35 years at this church. And I can tell you that I myself had a short tenure as being a deacon with Carol Kimsey. It was getting closer to his time and he decided at that point that his health was not allowing him 
to really do what he needed to do as a deacon. So he made the decision to go inactive. But while he was an active deacon here at the church, and I had that short few moments with him as a deacon, I will say this about Carol Kimsey. He was the first person to pull me aside when the church called me as a deacon. He was the first person to have an extended conversation with me about what it meant to be a deacon. He was the first person to say, if you need anything or if you need guidance about what it means and, and if you have questions, don't hesitate to come to me. And that's something that I've never told anyone. But Carol Kimsey was the first person to make sure that me as a young deacon knew the responsibilities of a deacon, but also knew that I had a brother. That if I ever had any questions or needed guidance, that he would be there for me. Because the fact of the matter is, is that's who Carol Kimsey was. He was someone that wouldn't just look out for the things that Carol Kimsey wanted or the things that Carol Kimsey needed. As you can tell, if I was to ask each and every one of you here today to come up and take a moment and tell of a time that Carol Kimsey looked out for your interest and your needs, every one of you would have a story about what Carol Kimsey has done for you. That's why you're here today. But it's because Carol Kimsey lived this scripture out loud. Carol Kimsey, as he was getting closer to his end here on earth, would still every now and then sneak in that back door when he felt like it. And he would sit at the back of the church. And he was always the first person to tell me that I did a good job after the service was over. Whether it was a stinker or not, <laughs> he was always there to tell me that I did a good job. But that's just who he was. He cared about other people. As I look at the service of a deacon, you know, I've always put the, the hierarchy of the church, if you will. I've always looked at it simply like this. I'm a country boy from Alabama, so I'm going to lay it out the only way I know how. But if I was trying to herd some cattle, and I was trying to maybe move them from one pasture to the next pasture, what you would have is you would have your people up front, your leaders, if you will, that would be leading those cows in the direction that they need to go. Then you would have your people that were also on the sides that if they started to veer off their own way, then you would have your people on the sides to kind of keep them in line. And then you would have your people behind the cattle to make sure that they pushed forward. True deacons will be at the back behind those cattle. They will walk through all the crud, all the crap, everything that comes from that horse. They will walk through every bit of it to make sure that that, horse, or that cow gets to where that cow needs to go. That was Carol Kinsey. Carol would do anything for you. It didn't matter what he had to walk through. It didn't matter what was going to stand in the way. If it was something that the church needed, if it was something that the members of the church needed, Carol Kimsey was going to find a way to make sure that other people were taken care of. Because I can safely say that he did that for me. And I can safely say that that's who he was. He was a man that didn't have to have spotlight. Didn't have to be up front so everybody could see what he was doing. He was a man that would go behind the scenes, make sure the church had what it needed, make sure that the people had what they needed, and make sure that every single thing that he was doing was a thing that would be pleasing to the Lord. So as we go to celebrate the life today, and as we go through this service, I really just want you to think about that scripture. Because Opie and I were talking the other day, and I asked him what he would be speaking on. And I told him that I was going to use what he was speaking on if I went first. But I chose not to do that. But during our conversation, we were also talking. And, and we were talking about funerals and speaking at funerals and, and being at funerals. And funerals can be tough for everyone because there is that loss. There is that, that void. You're going to miss the person. Even if we know the Bible and know that, that it's better at the day of death than the day of birth, we're going to miss the person and we're going to remember the good times that we had with them. And at times there's going to be sadness. 
But when you have a person like Carol, there's also kind of a sense of joy about it. Because you know the man that he was. You know what he's left you with. The good times, the memories, the things that he's done for you. But most importantly, you know where Carol is. We can never have full assurance. Every salvation is between you and God. But we can take a look at the fruits that someone bears. And when we look at Carol, we can have that hope that if we ourselves are saved, if we ourselves are Christians, if we ourselves have that relationship with the Lord, we can have that hope that when we pass on from this earth, that we too will be right where Carol is, at the feet of Jesus one day. But I want to leave you guys with a challenge. I'm giving you guys some homework. And for you children that have been in and out of school, I'm going to give you some homework today. I'm going to conclude with simply this, this verse. Let each of you look out, not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Meditate on that Scripture. Use that Scripture. And if you're ever confused about really what that Scripture means, outside of looking at what Jesus did in Scripture, think back to the example of a man like Carol Kimsey. Because that man lived this Scripture. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for the moments that we have, Father. And as, as we continue to celebrate His life, because Lord, we know there's sadness. We know that there's going to be days that, that are a little more difficult. And there's going to be times that we miss Him because we love Him. We love Carol. And we love the, the person that He was. And we love that He lived for You. And even through all that sadness, Lord, I think we can all look at it and we can celebrate His life and the things that He has done for each and every one of us. Lord, the, the things that He set an example for us to do, whether that be just simply being a good person, being a good church member, being a good deacon. Father, He was a great example of what it was like to love the Lord and to make sure that His love sh showed to everyone that He came in contact with. Lord, let us look to Your Word for guidance, but also let us remember the things that He did, Father, because He was a good example of Your Word. And as we go forward through the rest of our days, Lord, let us first make sure that we ourselves have that relationship with You. But Father, if we ever need some help along the way, and we need to understand something, Lord, He was a great example to look towards. Lord, as we continue with this service, we pray, Father, that, that everything that we do would bring honor and glory to You first, but also, Father, that we can walk out today knowing that even though Carol is no longer with us, we got to celebrate the good times that we had with him. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen.
I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, this is this is a uh, this is a hard harder service um, for me. Like uh, Brian said, as believers, we have the joy of sitting here and talking about Carol's life. Uh, but it also is hard for those that are left behind, uh, friends, family, loved ones. But I tell you, the other day I had one of the biggest honors in ministry that a person in ministry could have. Uh, the other day I had a call from Carla notifying me of Carol's passing. And the honor came not from her notification, uh, while you know it rings true that the pastor is always the last to no. know. The honor came from the family asking me to come up and speak about Carol. You see, I, I was pastor here and he was a deacon uh, while I was a pastor here. And, so that gave me the opportunity to get to know Carol a little bit. Uh, and what a joy and amazing time that was to, to know Carol, uh, to see what kind of a man he was, what kind of a husband he was. Man, he, he, loved, he loved his family, loved his wife, loved his kids. Never once did I hear him talk bad about his family or kids. I, I, would, I would love to be able to tell you that's true about my kids, but that's just not the truth. <laughs> Carol loved you guys. He was an amazing man. Well, I'll tell you, we don't mourn today the death of Carol like the rest of the world. We celebrate his life because of the hope and the person that he put his, his hope and trust in. And that is Jesus Christ. And I respect Carol with the highest amount of respect that I could, I could give anybody in this world and in this life. And I want to share, you, share to you why I respect him so much. Because if you look at, at Christianity, if you look at being a Christian, you should have the same desire as, as I do, same desire that Carol had, and that is to follow Jesus with every bit of who we are. In everything that we do, we should be just like Jesus, a little Christian, or a little Christ. That's what Christian means. And for Carol, he meant it. For Carol, he lived it every single day. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, as uh, like I said, the, the reason that I respect him so much came from my defining moment, my defining memory of who Carol was. It was towards the beginning of, of my time here as pastor, and I had just given an altar call, and lo and behold, I see someone stand up and start walking down the aisle. It was Carol. He was coming down the aisle. And I, I looked at him, and I see this, this, this deacon of the church. I knew he was the deacon. He came down, this leader of the church, this deacon of the church, and he came down the aisle. And at first, I thought something was wrong. I was like, oh, gosh, what happened? You know, what, what's, what's going on here? You know, I thought he was going to tell me something until I found out, yes, there was something wrong. But what was wrong was a little, little bit of what was inside of Carol. He came down to rededicate his life. I don't know what his age was at that moment, but I will tell you this. With a sincere heart, he came down and he knew that he could do better. He knew that he could live his life a little bit better for Christ than he was doing at that moment and at that time. And so he came down and he rededicated his life. And for me to see that, man, gave me all the respect in the world. You see, because that's the word that I want us to think about when we think about Carol. Brian talked about his service. I want to talk about his humility. Because here's the reality. When you follow Christ, when you study Christ, when you look at, at, at Jesus' life on earth, you come up with that word, humility, over and over and over again. Matthew 20, verse 28 says, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Carol understood that. Carol lived that. He lived his life with the humility that I can only hope and pray that I, that I do. You know, there are so many different ways that we can describe him. As a dad, as a father, as a husband, as a funny guy. I mean, here's the thing. If you didn't spend time with him, he, he could cut up with you a little bit. You know, I, I, I like that. I'm, I'm a little cut up myself. That makes why we got along. Matter of fact, I really wish I would. I'm looking at these pictures passing through before the service, and I see him with a big old fat mustache. Man, I wish I would have known him when he had that mustache. Woo -hoo! He looked like even more of a cut up when you had the mustache. I was like, he's a guy I could, man, I, I wanted to hang out with him at that point. 
But there are so many ways that we can remember Mr. Carroll. But the biggest way is a humble follower of Jesus Christ. And he teaches you that. You know, James 4 says this. James 4 verse 10 says, Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. Well, I want us to understand today that Carol humbled himself before the Lord. And I would love to, I mean, I'd, I'd sit there and say that one moment he humbled himself. But that's not just that one moment he humbled himself before the Lord. He did it all the time. And because he did that, because he believed in Jesus, because he put his hope and his trust in Jesus, I want us to remember 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 and on. It says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That's why we celebrate today. Amen. You may sit there and say, why do we celebrate? This is a sad day. You know, to be honest with you, it's sad for me on a selfish level. But in a grander scale of things, I celebrate today because of who Carol put his hope and trust and love in. And that is his Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so today, when we come here today, you know, we come celebrating not the life that he did live, live which was great. I mean, look around here. It's amazing the life that he lived. But today, I celebrate the life that he's living now. Worshiping his Savior in heaven. Standing before his Savior where he's always wanted to be. Where his desire was to be. Him worshiping the Lord here this morning. You know, for us as Christians here on earth, we can think about it. We can wish for it. We can put our hope in it. Right now, Carol's living it here today. And that's a reason to celebrate. We remember so many fond memories of Carol. We remember who, who he, he was when he lived on earth. Right now, I want us to think about what he's doing right now. Right now, he's not sad. Right now, he's not shedding tears. Right now, he's, he's just worshiping here this morning. So I want us to leave here today, maybe with a little sadness, but understand, that's on us. But I want us to leave here today knowing where Carol is. I don't want you to be uninformed about him. I don't want you to be wondering where Carol is. When he came down that aisle and talked to me that morning, that Sunday morning, I knew exactly where Carol would be when he leaves this earth. He made it very clear to me where he stood. He believed in Jesus. He believed in the salvation that comes only through Jesus. And that today is the best thing that we could say about Carol. That he loved the Lord. He loved you guys, but he loved the Lord. And that's where he is right now. And so while it's a hard day for me, because I won't get to have conversations with him. You know, I, I told uh, my wife <clears throat> the other day, I live in the same neighborhood as Carol. <laughs> Shame on me for not having more conversations with a man. Because I've never left a conversation with Carol that I didn't sit and think back, man, that was a great conversation. Wonderful conversation. Shame on me. That's on me. But uh, I want the family to know if you ever need anything, Janice, if you ever need anything, I, I told this to Carl. I probably told you this the other day when I talked to you. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm twice as quick to your house as they are, okay? They live close, but I'm really close. <laughs> If there's any way that I can serve you and your family, just let me know. So I can carry on the legacy that, that Carol left us. The legacy of service and the legacy of humility. Hi. Let me pray for us here this morning. Dear Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for blessing our lives with the life of Carol Kimsey. Lord, I thank you so much for allowing us to just a short time with him here on earth and Lord I look forward to the times where I can sit shoulder to shoulder with him once again and worship with him once again at the foot of your son man I, I, I love it that I, we can all worship together I can see him again Lord that's, that's, the, that's the vision that I have is once again that I'll be worshiping with him not in a building here on earth but in a, in, in a, in a place that is just so full of glory and so full of amazement that I can sit right next to him and we can worship you. 
and give you all the honor and the glory that you deserve. Lord, I thank you for the salvation that Carol is enjoying here today, Lord. I pray that if there's anybody in this room that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that I pray that they take the, take the lessons and the example that Carol is to us here today and ask you to be their Lord and Savior so that they too will know the joys and the amazement of salvation that comes through your Son. Lord, we thank you today. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good on, Philip. Oh, man. Well, I'm going to try and do two things here. I'm going to try and get through this a little slow because of our internet connection. And Also, not to be as eloquently or well spoken as the two men that preceded me, but uh, he's crying. You know, I think there's a part of all of us that thinks you're going to see him again. You're going to get one more time um, to hug them or to share a story that they're going to really get a kick out of. And so you hold on to that thought that you're going to get another chance. And so you roll up your sleeves and you get, you get busy in your own life. Now I, got, I got busy in my own life. And trust me guys, my life's really busy. Uh, But, you know, I, the pastors talked about how, you know, Christ is the ultimate example and we're all supposed to be many uh, versions of, of Christ and, you know, we're supposed to look to Christ for the ultimate example, but the older I got, and the more interactions that I have with Papa, the more I looked to him because it was, to me, it was a little more attainable. Um, Papa was such a man who was so gentle in his rebuking, his correcting, and his training. He was so gentle and confident in the way that he loved me and the way that he loved others and that is the real life example that I do to hang my hat on to be a better husband to be a better father to be a better person and you know there's I'm going to really miss him, and I know that I'm not the only one in the room that is going to feel the same way. Uh, you know, Papa was just, I like how the, the pastor brought up, uh, he cut up with you, because uh, I just remember so many times of him and I sitting at the kitchen table and we were playing poker. And we would, gosh, I wanted to play poker with him for hours. And he never once got tired or bored or said, you know, I want to do something else. Let's try and do something else. And he always made it so much fun. And, you know, I'm going to look back on those memories and just have continue to hold him up as the example for how the type of man I want to strive to be continually. I think to share an anecdotal story, and I think this story is pretty infamous uh, in Kimsey folklore now, but uh, there was a brief period where Cat and I uh, lived with Grandma Papa and 
grabs her pinto beans. And <laughs> I remember I got so upset and so convinced that I didn't want these pinto beans. And I wasn't going to eat these pinto beans. And it came down to, to just sort of a, for lack of a better term, a battle royale between me and Papa. Papa said, in as stern a voice as he could probably have mustered, Philip, you're going to sit there and, until you eat one, until you try it. And so finally there were some more tears and some more fits. And I broke down and I put one on my fork and I tried it. And just like I am now through snotty nose and running eyes tears and hiccuping and all that, I, I go, oh, these are actually pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> the look of frustrated joy on Papa's face, <laughs> I will never forget. And, you know, Kat and Graham were both there and just died laughing and we all had a great time. But just, he was so gentle and so kind, and I just keep coming back to, he was an example that I can use as my barometer. Thanks, guys. I was uh, preparing some remarks today. I was reminded by some uh, difficulties I had academically early in, in school. My third grade teacher, uh, Mrs. McHugh, mom, you remember her, uh, very dedicated educator. She called and said, uh, Mrs. Kenzie, Jerry's been having trouble with his grades. They've fallen off, and I'm really not sure why, because he has made really good scores on achievement tests and seems like he ought to be doing better in his, uh, on his grades, but I'll get to the bottom of it. And a couple of weeks later she called back and she says, I think I've gotten to the bottom of it, I think I know why he's having trouble with his grades. He's, uh, he's been doing it wrong. He's been highlighting with a black magic marker. <laughs> You know, you've heard a lot about Dad's public side, and uh, I think I can better give you an insight into his private side. But the two kind of overlap. It is, and it all maps back from his life to the cross. And that's how we ought to plan out our lives, and how we ought to map it out. Uh, Dad is a little shy, maybe you could even say introverted. Um, he he kind of worked through that later in life. Uh, he loved a good laugh. Uh, he was a good sport because many times the jokes were on him. Um, he was the he was the target a lot of times in the house, but he was he's always good to laugh it off, and he, he never seemed to get offended. Um, we love to compete together. Dad was always thinking up different ways that he and I could compete in little games that we could play. And I remember one afternoon I came home from school. When I was in high school and I was on the basketball team, and I had begun, I had finally gotten tall enough and had good enough jumping ability where I could begin to dunk the ball. And to me that was a big achievement. So, because I had two uncles that were quite good at basketball, and so that was a high bar for me to achieve. And so I was excited and excitedly telling Dad about this. He had gotten home before Mom did. Mom was still at work. 
Where's the dad I was able to dunk today? Oh man, he was so excited about that. He said, you know, when I was your age, I could jump pretty well. When I was in high school, I used to be able to jump up like onto the countertop where I worked. He said, in fact, I've got, I could still do it. I could still jump up on this table, on mother's dining room table. And I said, shoot, you couldn't jump on that chair right there. I bet you couldn't get that high. And he said, I bet I can too. So he takes a step, big jump. As soon as his feet contacted the top of that chair, that chair lost its structural integrity. It completely went to firewood. I don't think there were two pieces connected any longer. Well, and I happened to be standing there and I caught him, otherwise he'd have been in the deep freeze. So we kind of looked at each other like, uh-oh, now what are we going to do? And so we start, started thinking in terms of, you know what, I'm going to take this off. Works better. Um, in terms of wood glue and how much time we had before Mom got home. And I looked out the window and there's Mom in the carport. <laughs> You're in trouble, pal. <laughs> well, first he said, we're in trouble. And I said, what do you mean we, pal? <laughs> um, Mom and Dad, as the Bible says, trained us up in the way to go. And I can't give Dad all the credit for it because he was very wise to consult with his wife. And he and his wife, my mother, presented a united front to us, and it's something that Jenny and I have always aspired to do. Probably not as successfully or as eloquently as they did, but uh, we can credit Mom and Dad for that, I think. Um, and they didn't let us, they let us make our, a lot of our own mistakes. And, uh, but then they should, they were always quick to derive the lesson uh, that, that would belong into it. Um, Dad was fiercely protective of family, and he valued family a lot. And as proud as he was of Carla and I, I think he was even prouder of grandchildren. Um, he gloried in his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And every time he would talk about them, I could hear the pride and, and the glowing feeling that would come from his heart. So each and every one of you were tremendously special to him. Um, and I didn't think so at the time, but in retrospect, he was very patient. He was very patient in raising um, a very willful and hard-headed young man. And I'm sure that was because of his sense of deja vu. I remember uh, he asked one time if I could stick around and help him when he got home from work because there was a tree very near the front of the house that needed to come down. And I was in college at this time. And uh, I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And he said, don't start on it till I get home. And he was very, he was very precise about that point. And so I got out there and looked at it and I thought, well, I can get, I can get things organized. And, you know, I can... I could probably start on it. So I started cutting on it. So, Dad will be so happy when he gets home, this will all be done. Well, I was sure to check the wind. The wind was blowing away from the house. And somehow, during the process, God must have gotten into cahoots with Dad because the wind changed direction. It started going toward the house. And the tree started to lean toward the house. And I'm like, oh, I'm frantic now. I'm in a panic. I should have waited. And I ran to the garage, and I am looking for a rope. Kenny should be able to appreciate this. <laughs> I couldn't find a rope anywhere. There was no rope, chain, anything. So I grabbed the only thing I could find, which was a 50-foot garden hose. That really didn't do the trick. <laughs> but I tied it off anyway and tried to do my best. And the tree just finally just gently leaned on the house. Remarkably didn't do any damage, but the limbs just sort of supported it there. And uh, Dad got home, and uh, I wish we had a picture of the look on his face <laughs> when he saw the tree leaning on the house. He, wasn't, he was not pleased. And right after that, it was moments later, my brother in Christ, or 
arrived because we were he was going to help out and then we were going to go out on the town. Earl, it really didn't help that you laid down the driveway and left. <laughs> That did not help my case any at all. <laughs> I remember when I was smaller, Dad loved the Lord, but when I was smaller, I remember there was a period of time where he uh, was having trouble sleeping. And he was a shift worker, which is bad enough on your sleep anyway. But I remember him being up in the middle of the night several times. What I know now is that he was under conviction. And it was shortly after that that he gave his life to Christ. And from then on, he began to serve the Lord. And since that time, I always remember, I can't remember a period of time when he wasn't in some kind of service to the Lord. Uh, I, I remember when he was ordained as a deacon. And I'm glad to have those memories. And, and that example, um, I remember one winter, uh, we lived in Memphis, and we were small. And I'm not sure, but I think money was a little tight that year for Christmas. And I remember Dad was spending a lot of time out in the, in the store room where he kept all his tools. Uh, we had a pretty small house there. And uh, it was not heated out there, but he had a workbench set up. And he spent a lot of time out there, and what he was doing, and this is one of the coldest winters I can remember in Memphis. And he was out in that unheated storeroom making Christmas presents for Carla and I. He had taken some uh, steel nuts that go on a bolt, and had cut them, and had filed them down and made rings for us. And uh, what a treasure they were. He had inset them with some seashells that we had gotten, we brought back from the beach in North Carolina on a family vacation. Uh, how, how incredibly special were those. And I wish I could say I still had mine, but I have no idea where it got off to. As an as irresponsible child, I lost it, of course. But I still have that memory. And the memories and the things that Dad taught um, will stay with me. And that is the treasure that I carry. And so, it is with a full heart that I release Dad uh, for him to go and be with Christ. Because Dad and I had a wonderful relationship. I have no fences to mend. I don't think Dad and I ever left anything unsaid. We shared a lot with each other. Um, we shared a lot of experiences and uh, even more laughter together. So I don't have anything that I feel like that I did not get accomplished. And so the thought that I would leave with you, as, as I heard a pastor mention in a sermon one time, keep short accounts. And his point was keep short accounts with God. Make sure that all of your sins are confessed that you, can, you speak to God often enough to where your shortcomings are atoned for. Dad and I did this with each other. But now to map it out to the cross, keep those short accounts with God. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you have a choice to make. Because now I've gone and let the cat out of the bag. You have to do something about it. Give your life to Christ or not. But now you have to make that decision. You will leave here having made a decision. Make sure you make the right one. God bless.
Baby. 